Shalom Aleichem, Assalamu Aleichem. The Dead Sea Scrolls uncovered the first complete translation and interpretation of 50 key documents withheld for over 35 years. This is a book uh, written in part, in large part, by Robert Eisenman. Some of you may be familiar with Robert Eisenman from the book James, the Brother of Jesus, uh, which is also very much centered around the documents of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, Eisenman is actually um, a leading Dead Sea Scrolls scholar, though in the field of uh, early and pre-Christian studies, uh, he is a, a sort of fringe figure. So while he is an expert in uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, his conclusions regarding them have made him uh, somewhat marginalized in uh, the historical Jesus research. Now, uh, part of that is due to the unfamiliarity of many um, historians of Jesus research, uh, a term used for the quest for the historical Jesus, and in particular, uh, the third quest period. Um, the, the unfamiliarity with them with such scholars, uh, with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Most of them, they're, they're, they know what the Dead Sea Scrolls are. Uh, you know, anybody who's got the History Channel or something like that has any sort of pop cultural awareness, uh, knows what the Dead Sea Scrolls are. Could tell you just a little bit about them. Uh, but could they actually tell you, uh, in-depth details about the theology of the community. Um, most will in fact tell you uh, this this parroted belief, uh, which is demonstratively wrong, that Qumran was definitively the center of Essenic activity. This is absolutely not true. There's no question uh, that there were uh, centers all over in every town, uh, according to the first century CE historical third party sources. Uh, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of Essenes in every town. Um, so some of the bigger cities they avoided, um, but in every town it was well known that you could find Essenes. So while there was a, um, a base of operations, perhaps one of many, that was by the Dead Sea, that we assume is Qumran. Um, this was not uh, the, the sole place of Essenic activity by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, it was probably some sort of training facility, meditative retreat or hermitage, um, whatever it was, whether it was Qumran or whether it was another place. Uh, just like it in a similar area. I think there's there's a lot uh, a lot to be said for the argument that it is Qumran, uh, or that it was Qumran. Um, but, uh, so the fact that we don't find uh, a lot of families there in terms of the, the graveyard and, and things like that, um, we, uh, we, we shouldn't really be surprised by that. That does not in any way mean uh, as the uh, incorrect belief asserts that the Essenes were celibate. They were not celibate. Um, there were Essenes for a period of their initiation who were completely celibate. Um, and from the scrolls themselves, we see very Taoist-like ideas. Ideas that actually can in no way be differentiated from Taoist ideas, except that they are occurring within a strictly Judaic context. Um, we see some of them highlighted in this book, in fact. Uh, we, we see them in uh, some of, the, some of the, the peculiar names that we get for uh, some of these scrolls. Um, in fact, um, one of them that I think is, is pretty interesting, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's in here, uh, seminal emissions, purity laws, type A. Um, we, we see things like that um, throughout here. This is involved with 
uh, seminal emissions and so on. I love this one, uh, because this is very Taoist, uh, text 49, this is, um, uh, the 24th illustration, uh, that Eisenman includes. He loved his bodily emissions. This is, this is something that is, uh, Taoist through and through. Um, if people are not familiar with, uh, the ideas of groups that would have a hermitage, monastic groups. Now, I don't mean monastic as in Catholicism. I mean monastic as in uh, Taoist priests and monks, Buddhist uh, lamas, um, you know, Tibetan Buddhist Tumo practitioners, um, uh, the, the quote-unquote Mo Pai, which actually comes from a branch of Taoism um, only a couple of generations ago uh, with, with uh, Mo Tzu as the sort of ideal leader and uh, attributed source of the teachings. Um, uh, Shaivist sadhus and, and Vaishnavite uh, sadhus as well. But these ideas of loving your seminal emissions, um, of being greedy about their release, uh, saving them up, it does not merely indicate celibacy, uh, it indicates usually what you find within orders, within uh, religious practices that uh, love their seminal emissions, their bodily emissions. Um, you find that there will be an initiatory period of celibacy while the person learns to master retention of their essences, of their jing, for instance. And uh, over time, this is just simply regulated whether or not one has sexual intercourse or not. Um, and uh, if somebody decides to uh, reproduce, then they choose to pass semen. And uh, then they undergo uh, a period of uh, rejuvenation and restoring the balance in, in the body, uh, usually not engaging in rigorous meditative practices um, that are going to increase pressure in uh, the abdominal region that we can um, identify uh, in terms of the, the chakra system or in terms of the Taoist system with the Dantian, the lower Dantian. Um, so um, this is this misunderstanding by Josephus. He says, well, they're celibate. And then he has to admit, well, there are some that aren't celibate. You know, so what we have to realize is that Josephus was, like most people, a dabbler. Uh, he dabbled, he, he boasted about dabbling uh, in all of the, the Jewish sects of his time. But of course, we know that he wasn't even familiar with Jewish sects outside of uh, Judea. He knew absolutely nothing about Babylonian Jewry, and we have some very interesting finds archaeologically on uh, the, the Jewish magic that was being engaged in, in in Babylon at that time. More than 50% of Jewry was not centered in the Levant at that time. Um, we know he knew nothing about the Therapeutae, which may have been an, a, a branch of the Essenes. If not a branch, then certainly from a common source. Um, seems to be a group that uh, the historical Jesus was familiar with. We see their teachings as recorded by Philo. Uh, so we, we know that Josephus is not really giving us an exhaustive overview of the varieties and expressions of Jewish sectarianism. We also know that he, because of the length of time which he says he was involved, that he could not have achieved official membership within the Essene community as explained by the Dead Sea Scrolls. So Josephus is, as we'd say today, fronting. He, uh, he, he was not an Essene, even though he claims to have been. He dabbled. He, and the Essenes were open to this. And um, actually the Essenes were interesting because they, like the Karaites after them, refer to Gerim as just full Jews. Um, they refer to uh, Jews who uh, were outsiders and, and dabblers 
as Gerim. So someone who was not officially uh, uh, mikvahed into the, or baptized into the, the community, this is where the notion of baptism comes from in Christianity, uh, the three dunks even, being the three dunks of uh, Jewish conversion. Um, if someone wasn't uh, baptized or if they didn't do tevilah into the Essenic community, they weren't considered uh, Yehudim, according to, they weren't considered um, of the the Beit HaYehuda, uh, is, is how it's phrased uh, most often within the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, they weren't considered... Um, the sons of light, so the children of light. So uh, they they were open to Gerim or or potential Essenes, potential Jews in their view, um, uh, dabbling, but they didn't take them seriously until they became uh, children of light. So there are all sorts of rules within the Dead Sea Scrolls about. Uh, what level of participation such individuals could uh, engage in. Now, people who have only dabbled with reading the Dead Sea Scrolls oftentimes misunderstand this. Um, this also is due to people who dabble not being familiar with the variety of Jewish sectarian expressions, uh, not being familiar with uh, the use of the term uh, gerim in Karaitism. And uh, the views that we see, and there are, there is a a link. Karaitism we can't say is only linked to Sadduceeanism. Uh, there is a strong, there are strong Sadducean overtones with Karaitism, but there are some references to and some awareness of uh, some Dead Sea Scroll like um, ideas in in early Karaitism. Uh, and there is a strange sort of influence that the Isunim, the, the Isuniya, uh, had on um, the founder of Karaitism, including uh, the influence of his vegetarianism. But that's really a huge topic uh, that's neither here nor there as far as this particular discussion is concerned. Um, what... I would recommend this book for. There are a number of very interesting things. This uh, includes uh, the scrolls themselves, uh, some some of the at that time recently published uh, manuscripts, and you can see that it makes direct use. It draws directly from the Hebrew. Uh, so this is always good for Hebrew readers. You can go and actually uh, see, which is, is this is doable now. It's a lot more doable. We can access this stuff. I have all of the scrolls on DVD-ROM. Um, so this is a lot more doable today uh, to, to access what it actually says. Um, but it, it has other things. It has the magical uh, alphabet used. And an interesting thing to be noted there is that the, the Aleph is um, what would later be called an Ichthus. Uh, the, the, the Tav... Um, even in uh, the sort of proto-Hebraic uh, Sinaitic or, or proto-Canaanite um, script is a cross or a T. That's where we get the letter T from in, in English. Um, so this is very interesting because of um, the Aleph and the Tav being uh, et, uh Et ha shemaim ve et ha that you know, uh, it is a direct object indicator. Um, so we see in the pre Christian book called Revelation that is, uh, that was probably written by Jesus' disciple um, John, we see that um, Jesus is said to have called himself. Um, the Alpha, Aleph, and Omega. Omega being the final letter of uh, Greek, the Greek alphabet. But we know that this was not, that Revelation was not a work written originally in Greek. Um, so if it was not, which it wasn't, then he would have been saying that, he would have been saying, I am the Aleph and the Tav. So 
this is very interesting because uh, we know from historical sources that the pre-Christians, the the uh, when they were persecuted, they would make this ichthus sign, um, and we know that they would uh, make crosses. These were this was part of a secret secret uh, symbolism that they used, but they were using the direct object indicator in Hebrew in the Essenic magical language. So like many magical languages, it's not that they viewed that as the correct alphabet. They viewed it as a secret alphabet that people couldn't figure out. Um, so it was a way of guarding your secrets. So this is one of many strong indications, and this all comes back to Mr. Eisenman, that there was a strong Essenic connection to the pre-Christian Jewish followers of Jesus as a Jewish teacher, uh, as a um, uh, quasi-Essenic, maybe a, an Essenic breakaway, uh, I would argue a, a therapeute teacher who was missionizing to Essenes, maybe dissatisfied Essenes, because um, he's definitely not traveling around with John, who is uh, regarded by most historians today as almost certainly an Essene uh, proselyter. Uh, John's baptizing, John the Baptist, John's baptizing activity was conversion activity into the Essenic um, community, uh, which is very telling because Mark, the earliest of the Gospel accounts, begins giving uh, legitimacy to Jesus by... Um, contextualizing his quote-unquote ministry um, with initiation by John, baptism by John, Tevila by John. Um, so Jesus is set in relationship to and in subordination to, in subordination to, uh, arguably uh, in subordination to, uh, if you're Mandean, uh, John the Baptist. So since we know we we know right there that there's an Essenic connection. Also, we know that the Essenes were the only sect not mentioned in the canonical Christian writings uh, as being a sect that Jesus mentioned. And this would really only happen if um, you were addressing people of that sect. You would only not say Essenes in the third person if you're talking to Essenes. Uh, and the same goes for Therapeutae for that for that matter. But we know in the in the Gospel attributed to John that there are references to the therapeutae, um, to, to their practices, rather, uh, going into the closet. Philo explains this, uh, going into the closet to meditate and to pray. Um, this is uh, regarded as Jesus' um, instructions for how to commune with the Creator. Um, and, and it's almost verbatim what Philo explains as the therapeutae instructions. And, of course, we see in the name Therapeute that uh, the link with, with healing and healers. Um, and, interestingly enough, all of this Essenic and Therapeute activity is happening at the same time that the Tian Shi are and the Taiping movement are going on in China, also known as healers, setting up responsibility huts with communal, uh, you know, proto-communist ideas take what you need, leave the rest for the other people in the community, things like that. Um, uh, you even see holy water, uh, uh, magical incantation set over water and used uh, ritually by the Tian Shi. So it's very, very strange. Uh, there's, there's something going on in the world at that time that's really only being uh, tapped into. And unfortunately, it's being tapped into by historians that... that um, are just looking at one part of the elephant, the, the toenail or the trunk, the eyeball or the tail or the, you know, the little hair follicles on it, um, not realizing that there's this massive elephant, this great big elephant uh, that we should be taking a step back and looking at. Eisenman, of course, as I mentioned, uh, writes his uh, magnum opus, James, the brother of Jesus, which argues that some of the scrolls were written in the first century CE, and refer to uh, members of the pre-Christian Jewish community of Jesus. Uh, not focused on Jesus, but focused on his brother James, or Yaakov, 
um, James the Just, Yaakov HaTzedek, uh, at probably as, uh, well, Eisenman argues that he is the, the righteous teacher, the teacher of righteousness uh, mentioned. But I would argue that uh, if this is true, that this could have been a reference to a position, and that's why the righteous teacher, or teacher of righteousness, is not named, because it could be a position in the community. Um, that's a hypothesis that I'm only proposing here. Amongst his more controversial positions, Eisenman argues that uh, the liar, or Sheker, is none other than Paul of Tarsus, the founder of Christianity, um, and that he was the opponent of uh, James the Just, James the brother of Jesus. Uh, both books are worth checking out. This book is out of print. You can find it for sale used on Amazon.com. I picked this up for under $5. I believe it was $3. It's in pretty good condition. Um, so it's worth worth checking out. Uh, you could probably even pick up a used copy of James the Brother of Jesus at the same time and, um, and get free shipping on your order.